It's been said a few times tonight that we're in God's presence and it's true that He's here. He's everywhere. He cannot not be here. But tonight, God by His Holy Spirit is here in a, in a special way and in a distinct way because God responds to our hunger. He responds to the cry of our heart. He responds to our desire for Him. The Bible tells us that as we draw near to God, He draws near to us. So as we come on an encounter night, as we carve space out in our calendar, as we carve space out in our week, in our month, to come to God and ask specifically for Him to encounter us, I believe that God really responds to that that he responds to our desire, to the fact that we're here, to the fact that we've given of our worship. And I'm trusting and expecting that God is going to meet with you where you're at this evening and that you're going to have an experience of Almighty God tonight. Not just something that, that makes sense logically in your mind or that you can, you can compute, you can get your head around, but something that moves your heart, your spirit, that affects your body, that affects all of who you are with the reality of a living God who is desperately in love with each one of us and desperately wants to know us and for us to know him better. We're on this great journey through beyond the Calvary Road, looking at how the Holy Spirit has been given to us to help us to navigate the the challenge and the tension between our salvation and the moment when we'll be in glory with Jesus, the moment when there will be no more sin and we will have no more battles, we'll have, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more tears, there'll be no more pain, we will just be in a glorious place giving Jesus all the glory for eternity and it will be an amazing experience but that's not where we are today. Today we live in the tension of our world where there is sickness and pain and where we do battle with temptations and we battle with the stuff that's inside of our own hearts. And so God has given his Holy Spirit to us, to the church, to each of us individually, to walk beside us, to help us, to strengthen us, to equip us, to comfort us, to give us everything that we need for this journey. And as Leanne said, as she prayed, God has got a purpose for each one of us. There is a road for each one of us to walk. And the deal is that the Holy Spirit is ready and willing to walk every step of that road beside us, guiding us, keeping our feet on the path, speaking encouragement into our ears, putting strength into our spirit, putting um, love into our hearts so that we might better love other people. That's what he's here for. And he's here tonight to meet with us. So I'm expecting, I'm excited to open up the word. We've gone through these couple of weeks and I don't know, I guess I've been, I've been really stirred and challenged with how easily I neglect the Holy Spirit, how easily in my own walk with, walk with God I can forget to acknowledge the Holy Spirit as, as a person and all my prayers maybe go to God or they go to Jesus and just in the last week I've been challenged again that I need to speak to the Holy Spirit. He wants my attention, He wants a relationship with me and I've been challenged to work on that in my own life and really speak to Him. And we learned last week about how the Holy Spirit is the helper, the one who comforts and comes alongside. This morning, we heard how the Holy Spirit is the equipper, the one who puts grace gifts into our lives so that we can build up other people. You know that you have been saved with a purpose in mind. God had a purpose for you before the beginning of time. He saved you so that you might fulfill that purpose in your remaining time on the earth. And he has given the Holy Spirit so that you would have everything that you need to fulfill the purpose that God has already put into, into your life. In his master plan, there is not a wasted day. And the Holy Spirit is there to equip you for everything that he has. And today we're coming to look at the Holy Spirit who empowers us. Tom's spoken over the past couple of weeks about how we tend to put the Holy Spirit into a box, the box of supernatural power. And tonight we're going to open that box up and try and understand what it means for the Holy Spirit who comforts and equips us to also be the Holy Spirit who empowers us who puts power inside of us, who is our life source, the breath in our lungs, everything that we need to live out what God has put inside of us. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and this is the day of Pentecost. This morning, Tom preached from Acts 1, where Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. 
And Acts 2 is the moment where there is a specific experience of the Holy Spirit for the Jesus' disciples who had been waiting, who had been doing what they were told, waiting in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come. We're going to read from verse 1, Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in the one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I'm going to say. These men aren't drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I'm going to show wonders in the heaven above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can't read that passage, I don't think, if you know Jesus and if you know the Holy Spirit, without something stirring within you. As you think about the experience of the disciples in the upper room, as you reflect back to the prophet Joel writing things he didn't understand hundreds and hundreds of years before that were then being fulfilled in this incredible, miraculous way in this upper room in Jerusalem as the Holy Spirit fell. And for us this evening, I think we need to understand that for every believer there are two distinct experiences with the Holy Spirit. The first is the universal encounter with the Holy Spirit that every believer has when they are saved. In fact, we are being ministered to by the Holy Spirit before we're even able to put our trust in Jesus. The Bible tells us that no one can give their life over to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit has already done a work in their heart. The Bible tells us that we, no one can declare Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit is living within them. So we know that everybody has encountered the Holy Spirit before they're even able to say that they, they're going to put their trust in Jesus. And then once that salvation moment has happened, the Holy Spirit, as Tom has taught us, is the equipper and the comforter who walks with us through our lives. That is a universal experience for every single believer. You cannot be a believer in Jesus Christ without your life having been impacted by the Holy Spirit. But there is a second experience of the Holy Spirit. And it's this experience that we read about in Acts chapter 2. It's the experience that Jesus was promising in Acts chapter 1. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it is a distinct and specific encounter with the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit, which leads to a supernatural transformation of the believer. It is a distinct and specific encounter with the person of the Holy Spirit. The word that Jesus used in Acts chapter 1 when he said, you are going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, is baptizo, which means to dunk in or to immerse completely. But it's also the word that was used if you were going to a well and putting a bucket into the well, the bucket would be fully submerged in the water and then you would pull it out and it would be completely soaked and it would be completely filled because it had been fully immersed 
into the water in the well. Or if you were putting a ladle into a bucket of something that you wanted to drink, then you would baptizo the ladle in the fluid so that it was completely soaked, completely filled as it came back up again. And this is the experience that the disciples had in the upper room, where they were completely immersed in the Holy Spirit. They were dunked in the person of the Holy Spirit. And then as they're pulled up out of him, they are filled to the very brim with his presence and with his power. And the Bible tells us going on from here that you can continue to be filled. The word is Plato. That the Holy Spirit continues to pour himself into us so that after that initial experience, that initial baptizo experience, we continue to be filled. The bucket, as it were, having been pulled up, continues to be filled so that we can remain full of the Holy Spirit. We see it in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, where it says that um, Peter is filled again with the Holy Spirit. And for those of us who have had that encounter, we recognize this truth that the Bible tells us is our reality, that there's a moment where we have a first filling, and then there are subsequent moments where we experience a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, where we get to encounter his presence and be refilled with his power. And that's what's happening on the day of Pentecost. It is this baptizo moment where the disciples, having waited, are fully immersed in the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. And later on this evening, we're going to have an opportunity and we're believing that for some people here, this will be your baptizo moment where you're fully immersed in his presence and you're filled with his power. And what we can expect when that happens is what we see in this passage in Acts chapter 2. The first result of this experience of the Holy Spirit's power is that all the apostles were given the gift of being able to speak in a language that they hadn't learned. A language that they'd never been taught in school, that they'd never studied but the, the Holy Spirit supernaturally put within them and they were able to communicate in it. And we know that they went out of the upper room and they spoke and the Bible tells us that the people there understood what they were saying. And there's some question about whether they had been given an earthly language that the people understood or whether it was a heavenly language that the Holy Spirit helped the people to understand. I suppose it doesn't really matter, does it? Because ultimately they spoke a language they had never learned. And our conviction is that as we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the first outward expression of that is the ability to speak in an unknown language or a tongue. The other things that happen to these apostles after they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit is that they are filled with incredible boldness, courage, and ability beyond anything they would have had in themselves. Look at what Peter does as he walks out of the upper room. This is Peter, who was a fisherman. Peter, who probably had, had never, never really had any formal education. The reality was that if you taught the Bible in that day, you would have been schooled from a very, very young age to learn all the scriptures and all the law. And the rabbis who were trusted with the teaching of the word had given their whole life to the theoretical education in the law so that they were able to teach it. But Peter stands up in front of thousands of people because the Bible tells us that 3,000 were saved on that day. He stands up boldly, a fisherman, and declares the word of God. He links the prophecies of the Old Testament to the reality of what they've experienced in the weeks just before this moment. He crafts it all together. He declares, this is Jesus, the Messiah, whom you crucified. He goes back to Joel and says, this is what is happening now. He declares the word of God in a way which he would never have been able to do in his own power. He would never have had this understanding if the Holy Spirit hadn't just come on him and filled him with his power. So we know that this experience of the Holy Spirit will put a language within us that we haven't learned, will put boldness and courage within us that we wouldn't otherwise have, and will put ability inside of us that we don't understand, that we cannot explain in the natural. We can't understand how these things happen, but we know when we give glory to the Holy Spirit because he lives inside of us and he has filled us with his power. 
So that's what we expect when the Holy Spirit baptizes us in his power. And I want to talk quickly to some of you who are here tonight and you know that you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And as I was preparing and praying for this evening, you were on my heart and you were in my mind. And my journey of seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a frustrating one. It took me longer than I thought it should have done. I prayed and I sought God and I came forward here and asked people to pray with me. And I remember sitting on the steps up in the balcony with one of the leaders praying for me as I wept and couldn't understand why I wasn't experiencing this moment with the Holy Spirit. I remember going for walks out from where I lived and sitting in one spot looking out and onto this field and just praying and asking God for the gift of the Holy Spirit and doing what I'd been told to do which was speaking so that God could fill my mouth with the gift of tongues and nothing came and I was frustrated and I was, I was tired and I was starting to think, man, maybe this isn't going to happen for me. And my experience was it took, me, it took me about nine months to a year before the Holy Spirit came on me and I was baptized. I was baptized in my living room, just in a, a moment of prayer. The Holy Spirit met with me and I got the gift of tongues. And I don't understand exactly why it's different time frames for different people. I don't get it, but I've got a couple of things I want to encourage you with. In Genesis chapter 32, we read the story of Jacob as he wrestles with God. Jacob was a stubborn man, a difficult man, a man who was used to maneuvering to get his own way. And in Genesis 32, he's returning to his homeland and he's going to meet his brother, Esau. And he has tricked Esau out of Esau's birthright. He's run away from Esau decades previous. He's run away out of fear of what Esau would do to him. And he's coming back with everything that God has blessed him with. He now has two wives, he has servants, he has children, he has flocks which he's gained through sort of his, his ability to manipulate the situation. And he's coming back and he's praying to God saying, God, I am terrified about this moment that I'm coming to with Esau. There's something ahead of me and it puts the fear into me. And he's on his knees before God and Genesis 32 tells us that Jacob goes to spend the night on his own. He goes to spend the night just I guess with God and God comes and wrestles with him. A man comes and wrestles with him. And they wrestle all through the night and Jacob will not give up because he is stubborn. And as dawn starts to approach, the man touches Jacob's hip and dislocates it, puts him in pain and even so, Jacob hangs on to him. And the man says, let me go. Jacob says, I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you bless me. And he wrestles with God. And God says to him, okay, I'll bless you and I'll call you Israel because you have struggled with God. I think it's a beautiful picture for us of the struggle that some of us are going through of wrestling with God for what we know his promise is. And I would encourage you like Jacob to hold on, to hold on to God until he blesses you to hold on to him until that moment. But there's a couple of other things. You notice that he dislocates Jacob's hip. He makes him weak. He shows him his weakness before he blesses him. And we know as well that this happens the night before the biggest need in Jacob's life. The moment when Jacob would most need God's blessing to rest upon him is the moment when God chooses to bless him. And I think there's truth in that for us. That sometimes when we've wrestled with God, we have to realize our weakness and we might just, God might be waiting for our moment of biggest need to bless us with the power of his Holy Spirit. You know that the day of Pentecost happened on that day because it was the Feast of Weeks and Jerusalem was full of people. Full of people who had come back into the city I believe the Holy Spirit waited to that moment so that when Peter walked out, there would be a crowd ready to hear what the Holy Spirit had put into his heart, ready to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. 3,000 were added on that day from all over the place who then scattered and the church was born as those people spread out across the world. Why didn't the Holy Spirit come earlier? 
He was waiting for the moment of greatest need to come in power in that upper room and baptize those people so that they would be ready for what they'd been called to do. In our weakness and in our need, the Holy Spirit is ready to baptize us in power. I love Genesis 1-2. You know it. It says the earth was formless and void, but the Holy Spirit was hovering over the surface of the water. Week after week as I stand and worship with you, that's the picture that's in my head of the Holy Spirit hovering over us, hovering over this church, this family, in his power, in his love for us, ready to meet with us, ready to bring his creative energy, his divine inspiration, his supernatural power to bear at the moment when we need it most. I don't know where you're at tonight, but I believe that the person of the Holy Spirit is here and he's ready to meet with us. He's ready to baptize us in his power, to make us fit to do his work, to give us what we need. We know that we can't do it in our own strength. We know that there is no way. The whole time I was stood here before I came up, the one prayer that's on my lips is, God, I can't do this. There's no way I can stand up and speak, but by your Holy Spirit, would you help me? None of us can do it in our own strength. We recognize our weakness. We recognize our need and we come to him and we say, Holy Spirit, can I have my first filling? Can I have a fresh filling? Because I need that power that only comes from you. And he's here and he's ready to meet with us.